I have a couple of things to let you know about. Uh, it's always encouraging to have folks from the church who come to pre-trib, to the pre-trib conference in December. The dates this year are December 3rd through the 5th. And I just have, the, you can go to the pre-trib.org website and you can download a copy of the, the brochure for this year, but I have some hard copies out there on the table as you exit the back door, it's on the left. And this year, the topic for pre-trib is going to be related to Israel, which is always an important issue in understanding eschatology. And so the topic this year is remembering the Holocaust on Israel's 70th anniversary. And <clears throat> speakers, are going to include uh, Dr. Randall Price, as well as uh, Mark Musser, Dr. Paul uh, Wilkinson, who has, uh, uh, is from England, and he always, Paul always does a fabulous job, Johannes Vogel. How many of y'all have been to Israel and have seen the tabernacle in the wilderness? It was his grandfather that built that, who was a former SS Nazi in World War II and he was saved after World War II and became philo-Semitic and built this replica of the tabernacle full size and traveled around Israel with it as an evangelistic tool to get people interested and went to England and other places and then uh, his son took it over and grandson now teaches at a Bible school in, in uh, Germany. And about 20 years or so ago, they uh, arranged to give it to the state of Israel. And it's located down, uh, down south in the Negev, about 10 miles north of Elat. So he's going to be speaking um, as well. Then... The keynote speaker is a guy I've gotten to know over the last several years, Chris Edmonds. And I've heard him speak several times. He tells a story about his father, who was the first U.S. Army um, veteran to be recognized as a righteous among the Gentiles. It is a fabulous story. And he didn't know any of it until his father died and discovered... These, this material in his in in the attic, and discovered that when his father was a POW, he was the, an NCO and he was the highest ranking NCO. And one day, about two months before the war, uh, before the war ended, the uh, German officer in charge of the POW camp came out and told him, "Tomorrow morning, you will have all of the Jews in, among the American troops fall out." And the next morning, all of the American uh, NCOs were out together in unity. And he was asked uh, by the German co commandant, I told you to f bring all the Jews out, only the Jews out. He says, today, we're all Jews. And so the commandant pulled out his pistol and held it up against his head and said, if you don't get the Jews to fall out, I'm going to blow your brains out. And he looked at him and he said, that's fine. You can kill me now, but you will die within the next couple of months. You know the war is about to be over, and you will be held accountable for war crimes, and you will die. And so the uh, Nazi commandant backed down. And that day he saved about 300 Jews. So uh, he was recognized among the righteous, among the Gentiles. So uh, Chris Edmonds will be talking about his father, Sergeant Roddy Edmonds. Uh, David Hawking, Mitch Glazer ha will be speaking. I'm, that's the one I'm really looking forward to, Messianic Jews in the Warsaw Ghetto. Uh, Mitch Glazer, I believe, is the head of Chosen People Ministries. I may be wrong on that. He's one of the Jewish missionary ministries. He did his Ph.D. dissertation at UCLA on evangelism in the... Um, among the Jewish villages, Jewish communities in Eastern Europe between like 1900 and 1930 or 1890 and 1920, something like that. The generation that would have, that went through the Holocaust. And he tells phenomenal stories and has done the research to show how many 
Jews trusted Christ. There was a revival in the shtetl at, during that, the first 25, 30 years of the 20th century. And so it is believed, you can't document anything or prove anything, but that many of those Jews were marched to the death camps as evangelists along the way for the rest of the Jews going with them. And so that's one I'm really looking forward to, Messianic Jews in the Warsaw Ghetto, which of course was uh, decimated by the, by the Nazis. Oliver uh, Melnick, uh, Modern Jewish History from Never Again to Over Again. Uh, Michael Rydelnik, Faith After Auschwitz. Mike Stollard, Why the World Hates the Jews. And Dr. Arnold Fruchtenbaum will be giving his testimony and actually, there is a book out by this title that is the story of the of Fruchtenbaum family called When Your Face Was Your Destiny. And that is, um, I have read that, and that is a phenomenal story. So that's the pre-trib uh, conference. And then one other thing to bring to your attention, Jim Myers, who's here tonight, sent this to me the other day recommended and I looked at this it was a book review I think that was in Christianity Today was an outstanding on hymns talking about the importance of hymnals in the life of the church and this is called the hymnal a reading history tells stories of the hymns tells stories of uh, the writers of the hymns but one of the things and Jim was just telling me this that in the former Soviet Union when uh, they were taking Bibles away from everybody. They didn't confiscate their hymnals. We live in an age today when people lost their Bibles, they wouldn't have hymnals anymore. The hymnal has been a critical piece of the furniture of believers for the last three or four hundred years. And yet we're throwing them away. We're doing away with them. We don't need them anymore. And this is important to understand a lot about hymnals, and it fits in with what, what I've been teaching on Tuesday nights and understanding the music of the church and why, why that is important. So I'm going to try to get that review so that we can email it out uh, to everyone. Uh, also, Saturday morning, 7.30, we will have our men's prayer breakfast. So uh, we'll be talking about what we're reading in our Bibles, what we're learning, what the Lord's teaching us, and so look forward to seeing all of you guys there at 7.30 on Saturday morning. Before we begin tonight, we need to make sure we're in right relationship with the Lord, and we need to have time to reflect upon our lives to make sure that we are in right relationship with God. The Scripture says we're to walk by the Spirit. But when we stop walking by the Spirit and we... Uh, default to the sin nature, then nothing that we produce is going to uh, count for eternity. We produce relative good, relative righteousness, and we're controlled by our sin nature, which we'll talk a little bit more about uh, tonight. So we need to keep short accounts. We need to make sure that we're in right relationship with the Lord all the time. So we'll have a few moments of silent prayer before I open in prayer. Let's pray. Our Father, we're thankful that we can come together tonight. We're just so grateful for all that you have done for us, provided for us. We thank you for our friends here in the congregation. We thank you for those who aren't here and that are traveling, some here at the end of the uh, summer. Uh, others are just busy getting their calendar back in order and their schedule back in order as school starts, things of that nature. Father, we pray for us as a congregation that we'll be mindful of the importance of our relationship with you, raising that above the mundane and the everyday, recognizing how significant it is that we have such a rapport with the Creator God of the heavens and the earth and the seas and all that is in them. And Father, now as we approach your word and we talk about it, we pray that we will accurately and honestly uh, teach what is there and that you, your Holy Spirit, would use that in our lives to transform us into the image of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Okay, we're in 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 through 19, which is the beginning 
of the in, of the end of First Peter, the introductory paragraph, and it is focusing and refocusing our attention back on the topic of suffering, primarily undeserved suffering, although there's a recognition in Peter of deserved suffering on the part of believers. Throughout Peter, it has been, Peter has been talking about how to handle, how to be prepared for those times when we encounter, as he says in verse 12 of this chapter, the fiery trial, the unexpected suffering that comes our way uh, for what we've done right and not for what we have done wrong. And there will be a contrast in here in terms of judgment between the believer and the unbeliever. So in verse 12, he says, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. Don't think of the this trial as something strange or unexpected. That'll be the first thing we point out is it's not a surprise, but rejoice. That's the command to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings. And that's not salvific. That is simply, with the theme of Peter, as I pointed out last time, Jesus suffered undeserved suffering. Partaking in his suffering is not participating in the suffering of Christ on the cross. It is imitating his undeserved suffering in our lives. So, Uh, We partake of Christ's suffering only in that we too will participate or be the victims of undeserved suffering. That when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. And if you are reviled for the name of Christ, in my study on that a couple of weeks ago, I pointed out this means this idea of the name of someone, the name of something, indicates everything about that person, their character. And when it comes to Christ, it is what he stands for. It is his person and his work, going back to un- tracing that concept of the name of God through the, Old, through the Old Testament. That we are blessed when we are, when we have undeserved suffering, suffering for Christ, Uh, for the spirit of glory and of God rests upon us. And I took us back to the Old Testament quote on that, showing that this has something to say about how God gives us rest in the midst of suffering, tracing out the significance of that word, especially as it's used in, uh, as it alludes to the rest that occurred in the Garden of Eden. God rested Adam and Eve into the garden and there will be this also this same rest in the future millennial uh, kingdom. And then the contrast between the unbeliever, on their part he is blasphemed, but on your part God is glorified. But That means that we're demonstrating that he's significant, he's important, that without him we can't have life, that he is central to everything about our life. So the first thing Peter states is that we... Uh, face suffering for our that when we face suffering for our belief in Jesus, it should not be a surprise. Uh, Matthew ten twenty two, John fifteen eighteen to twenty one are passages where Jesus predicted this. Second, in verse thirteen, we see that the suffering here is related to Christ's suffering. It's undeserved suffering, specifically for for our testimony for being a Christian. The principles here apply to any sort of undeserved suffering and in some sense to any suffering in general, but specifically what Peter's talking about is when we suffer as a Christian, as we'll see when we get down to verse, uh, um, where are we? When we get down to about verse, I turned to the wrong chapter, when we get down to the about verse 15 and 16, uh, suffering as a Christian that when his glory is revealed, you may also um, be glad with exceeding joy. And then the third thing I pointed out last time, when the believer suffers for his belief and obedience to Jesus, it's a source of blessing which will reverberate through eternity, that when we are reproached for the name of Christ, we're blessed. And this is part of that for which we will be rewarded. I use this chart to talk about the fact that there are nine judgments and four resurrections that are covered eschatologically. 
Now, the reason I put this up is that what we see in as the background to this is that we're living today in light of eternity, that future reward that is ours at the Bema seat if we are obedient and suffering uh, in an undeserved suffering for the cause of Christ, for who Christ is and what he has done. What happens, though, when we get down to a passage like verse 17 that talks about judgment is that, that a lot of commentators automatically take that word judgment and they apply it to some sort of eschatological judgment. There are others that take other positions, but a lot of them will, and it, they're, they're, they don't necessarily make clear distinctions between the Bema seat for Christians and uh, the great white throne judgment. And sometimes they're, they're just talking about, especially if they're not dispensational, the judgment that precedes the coming of Christ. So it's, it's fuzzy and it's not clear. Uh, what we're talking about is that at the Bema seat, there will be an evaluation, as we'll talk about in just a minute. We talked about this last time in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, that at the Bema seat, that we will be rewarded for our walk by the Holy Spirit in this life. From this, we went to James 1, 2 through 4, looking at the vocabulary there and pointed out the similarities between James 1, 2 through 4 and 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 9, and talking about uh, the fact that we're going to, going to face trials, we're going to face testing, that this is designed to prove or demonstrate God's grace in our lives as well as to uh, mature us. And this, I will point out, is also a form of judgment. We tend to think of judgment only in terms of its negative as condemnation, but the word judgment is used in passages that has to do with God's doing something that is evaluating our life. And the word that we find in 1 Peter and James and 1 Corinthians 3 is the word related to the verb dokimazo, to test for the purpose of approval or evaluation. So that's part of, of what we'll see, part of judgment. Then I put this slide up there, sort of a graphic giving us a, a blueprint of the Christian life. We start off in phase one, we hear the gospel to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, his substitutionary death on the cross. We trust in him, we believe him, that's what we refer to usually as phase one salvation, justification by faith alone. Then we live in phase two, that's our life after salvation, and we live in one, in either the upper circle here or the bottom circle, top or bottom, and there it's cyclical. But if we go through the scriptures, what we see for church age believers, we're not talking about Old Testament believers, I'll make a comment on them later, but in each dispensation, the steward of the dispensation has specific responsibilities for which they are evaluated in their judgment. In the Old Testament, in the uh, dispensations, the two dispensations related to Israel, the dispensation of the patriarchs and the dispensation of the law. The basis for evaluation is God's revelation to Abraham under the Abrahamic covenant and then the specifics to Moses where it's expanded quite a bit in the Mosaic law. You don't have the Holy Spirit indwelling or filling or teaching or uh, directing the lives of believers in the Old Testament. God holds us accountable for that which he has commanded and for that which he has enabled. So Old Testament believers are not evaluated for the same things that church age believers are evaluated. We're evaluated on the basis of these various commands that we run into in Scripture related to or synonymous to the phrase walking by the Spirit, walking according to the Spirit, and we'll look at that in just a minute. And so when we walk by the Spirit, then God the Holy Spirit is producing something in our lives. 
But when we stop walking by the Spirit, there's a default position, and that is to walk according to the sin nature. It's one or the other. It's not a both and. The grammar doesn't allow it anywhere, neither does the context or the explanations for somebody being a little bit one and a little bit of the other. There's no third area that's a blend of the two. There's just all these options, which we'll go through uh, just a minute. And the result is that at the judgment seat of Christ, that which is done through, by walking through the Spirit in obedience to the Lord uh, yields rewards and inheritance, and that which is done in the sin nature, according to the sin nature, we have a loss of rewards. And if there's nothing, then temporary shame at the judgment seat of Christ. Now, what's the basis for this? Because I know people have questions. I mean, I had questions. I went through a period as a young pastor over 10 years coming out of seminary, where in my seminary experience, and it's been the seminary experience of a lot of guys going through Dallas the last probably 30, 40 years, is that there's not a clear understanding among the faculty at Dallas since the late 60s of that there's a, something that is distinctively a dispensational view of the spiritual life. I think a lot of people have come to understand that better. But I remember in the early 80s, there was a book that came out that was five views of, this, of sanctification. And there was the um, Lutheran view, I believe. There's been a couple like that, so I may be wrong on that. But there's the Reform view, there's the Keswick view, there's the dispensational uh, what was it? It was the Augustinian dispensational view of sanctification written by Dr. John Walvert, who was a president of Dallas Seminary. And I remember talking to guys and hearing guys' comments that I didn't know there was a dispensational view of sanctification. Now, <clears throat> now I've talked about this and taught this many, many times in the past, and you can go back and you can look up those lessons and, and drill down into the details. But one of the things I discovered and realized, it really came to my mind when we were going through Romans in Romans 6, is that when Paul talks about, don't you know that you have been baptized into the death and the burial of Jesus Christ and that you have been raised with him in baptism in Romans 6, 3 through 4, that, and all that's referring to the baptism by the Holy Spirit, that that breaks the power of the sin nature. That that never happened before because prior to the beginning of the church age, there was no baptism by the Holy Spirit. There was no body of Christ. None of those things that happened were available to Old Testament believers. So if they haven't had the power of the sin nature broken, then whatever basis that they're uh, judged for, that they're evaluated on when the Old Testament saints are resurrected, it can't be on the same basis for you and I, because something special has happened to us. That power of the sin nature is broken. Well, that's a dispensational distinctive right there. That tells you right away that the spiritual life of the church age believer has a totally different basis than the spiritual life of the Old Testament. But right away you realize, if you're theologically astute, is that the way Reformed theology has approached things is that uh, the church in the uh, Israel in the Old Testament is really the church in the Old Testament, and the church in the New Testament is um, is Israel, spiritual Israel, and that comes out of their whole understanding of um, or their their whole non-literal or allegorical approach to the Old Testament. And so they think the spiritual life in the Old Testament is roughly the same as the spiritual life of the New Testament. And this informs their understanding of salvation and leads them to different aspects of lordship salvation, but it creates the, 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 the basic profile of the Reformed view of sanctification. Now, if you want to understand some of these things and go into a little more depth, and I encourage you to go back, I believe it was the 2012 Chafer Conference focused on sanctification. 
And there were papers that were given contrasting the reform view of sanctification with dispensational sanctification. Did you do that one? Yeah, Jim, Jim Myers did that one. And um, uh, there are uh, other uh, aspects that were brought out, papers done, good papers that were done on Romans uh, 6 by George Meisinger, Romans 7, I uh, can't remember who did Romans 7, Andy Woods, and Romans 8 by Dan Ingram. And so all of those were, were very well done. Well, the foundation is really what we see here up on the screen is a command in Galatians 5, 16, and 17. Now remember, Galatians was written early. This is Paul's first epistle, so it's somewhere around 50. Now, one of the things that struck me when I taught through Galatians back in 98, 99, 2000, I think, uh, for, first thing I taught when I went to, went to Preston City Bible Church was to make sure everybody really understood a free grace gospel and what uh, sanctification was all about, it, is that Galatians covers a lot of the same material that Romans covers. But Romans reflects a more mature understanding by the Apostle Paul. Doesn't mean it's different. He just goes into these same things in more depth, a little more detail, from a slightly different vantage point. But what we have here in 516 is this contrast between walking in the Spirit and the lust of the flesh. Walking and the, the Greek there is uh, the preposition in plus the dative indicates means, walk by means of the Spirit. And then there's this interesting phrase, and you shall not fulfill. But in the Greek, it's a very strong statement in the Greek. It has two words at the beginning, u and me. They both mean no. Now in English, if you take two no's, and put them together, it, they cancel each other out. It's called a double negative, and, um, and that means a positive. But in Greek, if you, if you really want to emphasize that something is impossible, then you put these two together, and then you put a verb in the subjunctive mood, which is exactly what we have here, so that what Paul is saying, walk by means of the Spirit, and it will be impossible for you to bring to completion the lust of the flesh. And then he goes into verse 17, the contrast between these two, that they're mutually exclusive. You can't walk a little by the Spirit and be a little... Uh, under the power of the sin nature. And sometimes it gets confusing, but the end results begin to be clear after a while. And that's why, first of all, he lists the uh, um, consequences uh, for those who are walking according to the sin nature. Doesn't mean they're not saved, is that they haven't learned to walk according to the Spirit. And so he says, the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. See, there's this, this stark contrast. Not only do you have it grammatically, you have it spelled out in the explanation. Uh, and so he goes on, and then he says in verse 19, now the works of the flesh are evident. And the idea there is they become clear, and that's what Romans 7 is really all about. You can start off trying to do the right thing, but eventually what happens if you're Motivation comes from the sin nature, even though you are doing what superficially appears to be good things, it leads to bad results. The, some of these results are spelled out here. Uh, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, which is the word pharmakeia, has to do with using uh, hallucinogens, drugs, different things like that to enhance the worship and the uh, in integration with the God in pagan worship. Uh, so it's not just, um, not sorcery per se, that's the old English uh, word. Contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, and heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like. See, Paul draws, has these lists and there's stark contrast between the one side and the other side. And then he says the fruit of the Spirit, that is the one who is walking by the Spirit in verse 16, is um, going to, the Holy Spirit will produce these things in that person's life 
over time. And their love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, against such there's no law. Now, that sets up, that whole context sets up this contrast. It's, it's one or the other. You get into Romans 7. So if you want to follow along with me, let, we'll just go back. I'm not going to put all of Romans 7 and 8 up here on the screen. But we want to look at some of the things that, that are said here. Now, in Romans 6, 7, and 8, we have Paul's focus on the spiritual life. He's talked about man's depravity in the first two chapters, in chapters 3 and 4, and some of 5. He's talking about justification and how a person is justified. 5 focuses on the benefits of justification. And then starting in chapter 6, he begins to talk about how the justified person is supposed to live. And they are, not, they are to live on the basis of the, the knowledge that their sin nature's power has been broken. The sin nature hasn't been removed, but its power has been broken. So that in um, verse 11 he says, Likewise you also reckon or consider yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Jesus Christ our Lord. Never would, was anything like that said to an Old Testament believer. So the basis for the spiritual life is laid down in chapter 6, and that is on the foundation of the, uh, 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 of, of the baptism by the Holy Spirit. And then Paul gives his personal testimony in chapter 7. As a new believer, he tries to please God on the basis of obedience to the law, which was morality, and that's why in that, this chapter he says the law is good and righteous and holy. I had somebody one time tell me, oh, the law was terrible, it produced legalism. No, Paul says the law is good and righteous and holy. It's, it's the basis for evaluation for how a believer uh, does in the Old Testament. But what we see is that the more Paul tried to be moral and good and to do what was superficially righteous things, no matter what, how good his motivation was, it didn't work out well. It didn't end well for him. He was pretty miserable. The last thing he says in the chapter as oh, in verse 24, is a oh, wretched man that I am who will deliver me from this body of death. He's living, he's realizing the death-like experience of an unbeliever that he's separated from God because whatever he's doing isn't working. The Spirit of God's mentioned once earlier in the chapter, but the role of the Holy Spirit isn't brought into play until you get to chapter 8. Chapter 7 is Paul trying to do it his way without the Holy Spirit. Chapter 8 is Paul's realization and coming to learn of the role of the Holy Spirit and how that transforms his life. So in verse 5, I just want to hit a few key verses here. Verse 5, he says, For we were in the flesh, the sinful passions were aroused by the law, we're at work in our members to bear fruit to death. So that's what he's talking about here is unbelievers, their sinful passions brought them this fruit to death. And I think that when he says in the flesh here, he's talking about uh, before they are saved. And then a little later, he said, he's, talks about the, the transformation there and of his basis for living the Christian life. In verse 13, he says, has then what is good become death to me? And here he recognizes that he's doing a good thing, maybe a right thing for right reasons, but not on the right basis. And he says, no, it's become death to me. The, doing the law for the right reasons, I want to please God, but I'm leaving out the Holy Spirit and it's become death to me. Now, this isn't physical death, and this isn't spiritual death. It's what we'd call carnal death. Uh, 
that is our operational death maybe it's that we're trying to do the right thing in the power of our and and if we're not doing it in the power of the sin nature the only alternative is to do it according to, if we're not doing it in the power of the Holy Spirit, rather, the only alternative is to do it in the power of the sin nature. Those are the only options. There's no neutral in between. So he says, but sin, he says, has then what is good become death to me? He says, certainly not. But sin, that it might appear sin, was producing death in me through what is good. Okay? So doing what is good the, for the, on the wrong basis still yields negative consequences. It's not of eternal value. And he says, this works itself out so that sin through the commandment might become exceedingly sinful. Verse 14, for we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, that is fleshly. The law, he says, is spiritual. It's good. But I'm carnal. I can't do it. <coughs> and, and I just put in there in brackets, apart from the walking by the Spirit, because that's the solution when we see it in Romans 8 as well as in Galatians 5. And verse 15, For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good I don't find. That's a pretty clear statement that when I'm not walking by the Spirit, that even if I want to do good and I try to do good, the end result is it's not really good. It's not the good I'm looking for. Then in verse 21 we read, I find then a law that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man. But I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. It's not that, that when you're not walking with the Lord, it's not that you don't understand what you've learned about Scripture. It's not that you can't want to do the right thing. It's that, that, that energizing power of the Holy Spirit isn't at work in you. Because you're, we're trying to do it apart from the Holy Spirit, and the result is uh, very negative, which is what Paul states in verse 24, O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? He is just frustrated as he can be by the end of chapter 7. And then he makes that wonderful announcement in 8.1, there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the Spirit. Now there have been many who think that, there, there are some that think that this is taken from later on, there's a textual problem here, but uh, I accept this as being part of verse 1. Uh, for the sake of teaching, the truth is there later, even if it's repeated in the passage, it's still there. But the issue here is it shows that there's this contrast. We either walk according to the flesh, the flesh being the body of sin and the sin nature, or according to the Spirit. Now, in Galatians 5.16, Paul uses the phrase in pneumity or by means of the Spirit, but here he uses the uh, an alternate or synonymous phrase using the preposition kata according to the standard of the Spirit. They're both talking about the same thing. And so he is saying that it's either one or the other. You're either walking according to the flesh or you're walking according to the Spirit, which is why in the diagram, in the flow chart, I have, you know, the upper cycle and the lower cycle is because scripturally it appears that they are distinguished and there's no middle ground. There's no blending of the two or overlapping of the two. And then in verse 4, Paul goes on to say that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. It's one or the other. For those who live according to the flesh, that their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be fleshly minded or carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. 
So this becomes the framework. Now you look at other passages. What we see in Galatians 5, as well as in Romans 7 and 8, is that the key to producing fruit is this walking by the Spirit or walking according to the Spirit. So if we were to lay this out in a logical framework, we would say that in these passages, the result of walking by the Spirit, walking according to the flesh, is to bear fruit. doesn't happen without walking by the Spirit. But then we look at John, in the Gospel of John, and what Jesus said in the Upper Room Discourse, and Jesus says something, uh, says the same thing, but he says it with completely different vocabulary, but he does use the imagery of the bearing of fruit. And here he uses the imagery of the vine. Now, in Reformed theology, the vine here represents every believer, and every believer abides so that every believer will bear fruit. And if you don't bear fruit, then you're not truly a believer. This is why this, this breaks down this way. And not everybody's consistent, but this is where, where the lines are drawn between the free grace camp and the reformed camp and why they're this way. That's why they, they, those, are, those are the glasses, as it were, that, that uh, uh, different sides will put on. So Jesus says he's the true vine, the Father's the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. Now, that's not a good translation of the Greek word iro there. It can mean to take away, but it also can mean to lift up. And in my studies on that, I go through the various verses where that's, that uh, demonstrates that. And in a wonderful work, a uh, couple of studies, there's one called The Disciple Maker by Earl Rodmacher and Gary... Um, What's his name? Derrickson, who's a graduate of Texas A&M, got his degree in viticulture. Then he went to Dallas Theological Seminary, and he did the research in how to grow grapes and how the, the, the uh, practice of growing grapes was done in the uh, early uh, first century. And he brings out the point that, and has quotes from, Pl from uh, Pliny and others, uh, on this, and he says that the, the procedure was that you would go along and you would t look at the new growth that's fresh for this year, and it has not borne any fruit yet. So what you do then is you prop it up. You prop it up so that it gets more sunshine, it gets more airflow around it, so that it will grow stronger by next year, and next year it will bear fruit. What happens with a lot of lordship people is they come along and they say taking away is they, they're not bearing fruit, so they're not saved, so they're removed. And then when it says later they're thrown in the fire, that's eternal judgment. Um, that doesn't fit the analogy with what was going on in viticulture. The culture at the time, neither does it necessarily fit good theology or exegesis. Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Now, what do you do when you prune? You cut off some branches and, and other growth that's sucking uh, life away from the plant so that the strong branches will bear more fruit. So you have uh, that which bears fruit, that which bears more fruit, and that's which will bear uh, much more fruit. And then Jesus makes it clear. He says, you are talking to his 11 disciples. He's already made this point back in John 13. You are already clean. There was one that wasn't clean. That was Judas. But he removed Judas, sent him away. So now he's left with the 11. He says, you're all clean. You're positionally clean. You're saved. Because of the word which I've spoken to you, they've all trusted in the gospel. And then Let's see, in verse 4 he says, Abide in me, that's the command, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself. You know, we have to get that from abiding in Christ. Now, 
Galatians says you walk by the Spirit. That's the sine qua non, the without which nothing. That's the necessity for producing fruit. Same thing in Romans 7 and 8. You have to have the Holy Spirit to walk by the Spirit to produce fruit. Here Jesus is saying if you're going to bear fruit, then you have to abide in me. Well, if A, walking by the Spirit, produces C, bearing fruit in Galatians and Romans, and then Jesus comes along and says B is necessary to produce C, which is bearing a fruit, then A and B have to be roughly synonymous. And so here, abiding in Christ is another way of talking about walking by the Spirit. In other words, if we're walking by the Spirit, we're abiding in Christ. When we stop walking, we stop abiding. But those are the options. It's a binary option, one or the other. It's not like today where in some circles they refuse to believe in binary options, so there's not male or female. There's male, there's female, there's trans this, there's trans that. You have all these. I've noticed recently in filling out forms that that hasn't made it to the doctor's offices yet. It's still M or F. It's a binary option. And I was filling something out on a government form not long ago, and I noticed that it hadn't made it that far either. Federal government still recognizes a binary option. So binary option indicates A or B. Uh, there's no mix. There's not something else. There's not a trans category. There's just one or the other. So that's what Jesus is saying here. I'm the vine, you're the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. Another very strong statement of dependence on Christ. It's either depending on him and abiding or not. Then verse 6. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. Now, that's not talking about eternal uh, condemnation. That is talking about the sin unto death. If you're not going to abide, abide, then eventually God is going to, you know, you're going to be pruned off because we're going to put the energy where there's real fruit production. So if anyone does not abide in me, he's cast out as a branch and is withered, Do I have that over here? Yes, I do. Uh, He's withered, and they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. Now, that last part is just referring to this is what happens in the story. This is what the farmer does. This is what the uh, vine dresser does. He prunes, and that which isn't productive is then gathered up and burned. And that is just talking about temporary, uh, temporal divine discipline, not eternal divine discipline. And so the focus here is, is this, ju- this is a judgment, but it's a temporal judgment. We're going to look at that in just a minute as we go into the next part of, of First Peter. But what this shows you is these passages and, and many others that are talking about the spiritual life emphasize that we basically have, have two options. Now, we all know that when we're out of fellowship, we still want to obey God and do the right thing. Paul demonstrates that kind of attitude in Romans 7, but says, no, this wasn't walking by the Spirit. This, this, this led to death. And so he recognizes these are the only options. Now, I don't know when I'm always know when I'm out of fellowship or in fellowship, and I need to make sure I should keep short accounts. So I need to remember to confess sin and to refocus as much as I possibly can. And at the judgment seat of Christ, God is going to sort it all out because he knows better than I do. A lot of times I think, well, I was, in, I was walking with the Lord, and I wasn't. And other times I wasn't, but I didn't think I was, but I was. You know, God is the one who truly understands, so we just have to do the best we can in evaluating our own walk and confessing sin when, we're, when we can and let God sort it out. Now, let's go back to our passage in 1 Peter, and we'll spend the next uh, few minutes uh, walking our way through this, trying to understand this last part, where Peter is talking about what God is doing 
through undeserved suffering in the life of believers. Just as God did something incredible in the undeserved suffering that our Lord faced when he went to the cross to die, die on the cross for our sins. Somehow, I think I sort of jumped ahead here. May have. Okay, we go back to uh, verse 15. I've covered up to verse 14. But then in verse 15, we're going to have a contrast. In verses 12 through 14, the focus has been on suffering for Christ. It is... Uh, for doing the right thing. It is undeserved suffering. It is uh, described as partaking of Christ's sufferings in verse 13. It is then described in verse 14 as being reproached for the name of Christ. And then it will be spoken of as suffering as a Christian in verse 16. So it's very clear that the overall context of this, uh, this paragraph from 12 through 19 is on not on judicial condemnation of these believers, but on their uh, demonstrating their approval, evaluating them through testing, just as James talks about in James 1 to, 1. Uh, two through four. But there's one verse in here that talks about suffering deserves suffering. And he says, and it's a warning, he says, let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, or as a busybody in other people's matters in other people's lives. So we'll just take a minute to look at this. This is pretty obvious, I think, for many people, is that we can suffer for doing the wrong things. As, as Paul puts it in Galatians chapter 5, we reap what we sow. So he warns, on the one hand, you suffer undeserved suffering, and it's not characterized, should not be characterized by shame, because what you're doing is glorifying God. And so in uh, these, this verse and the next verse, in 15 and 16, you have the contrast between deserved suffering, which leads to shame, and undeserved suffering, which brings glory uh, to God. And it's interesting as we look at this and we talk about suffering, the verb that is used here is the Greek word pasco. Pasco is just a standard word for suffering. It can involve deserved suffering, undeserved suffering. It can involve various kinds of suffering. But if we look at Peter alone, we discovered that it's used a total of 11 times. So this is a major idea in Peter. It's used numerous times in the rest of the New Testament, uh, and the predominant part of it is to talk about Jesus' suffering in relation to the cross. In Luke 17, 25, he predicts the suffering. Uh, he says, but first he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. In Levitic, I mean, in Luke 22, 15, when he's eating the Passover with his disciples, he says, uh, with fervent desire, I have, a des I have desire to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. So he's talking about that physical suffering on the cross. It's then uh, he describes to those uh, on the road to Emmaus in Luke 24, 26, ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And verse 46, then he said to them, thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead, uh, the third day, it's picked up this way in Acts, uh, in three different verses in Acts. It's picked up this way in Philippians 1.29. For to you it has been granted on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. And there the idea is still undeserved suffering. So the prominent idea when it's talking about suffering, using this word in the New Testament, 
is to emphasize undeserved suffering. And that's how Peter uses it, whether he's talking about the undeserved suffering of Christ on the cross or whether he is talking about the undeserved suffering of the believers to whom he is writing. And so he does recognize a deserved suffering, but that's not where he's putting his emphasis. And the reason I say that is that we're headed to understand this verse, verse 17, for the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? And a lot of people, I've heard this quoted and misquoted uh, many different contexts, but often this is applied to church discipline or some kind of judgment on, negative judgment on believers. And what I'm pointing out here in this broad look at the context is the context of Peter is a context that these believers are suffering for a positive reason for their spiritual growth, for their evaluation, for their testimony, and to glorify uh, God. So uh, we see these passages, 1 Peter 2.19, suffering wrongly, 1 Peter 2.20, doing good and suffering, 1 Peter 2.21, Christ undeserved suffering. 1 Peter 2.23, he was reviled and did not revile in return. Again, it's his undeserved suffering. In 1 Peter 3, uh, you should suffer for righteousness' sake. 1 Peter 3.17, to suffer for doing good. 1 Peter 3.18, for Christ also suffered once for sin. Then we get into chapter 4, therefore Christ suffered for us in the flesh, undeserved suffering. And in verses 3 and 4, we've spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles. See, they're making us suffer now because back then we had fun and we partied with them. And now when, we, when we're saying, no, that's not part of my life anymore, now they're going to punish us for that. Mostly it's because they're under conviction. So what we see here is the fourth thing that Peter brings out in this section, and that is we're not to suffer for our own wrongdoing. The contrast between suffering for being a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, or a busybody versus suffering as a Christian. Uh, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this manner. Again, it's contrasting two things. Uh, being shamed or glorifying God. Now, when we look at verse 15, what do you notice about those four categories that are listed? A murderer, a thief, an evildoer, or a busybody? Well, the first two are not only sins, they're criminal. And as a result, there should not only be consequences to sin that comes from God, but also criminal penalties for breaking the law. But an evildoer is a broad word that doesn't refer to a criminal action. The same is true of a busybody. Now, when we think of a murderer, though, we also should think of the fact that Jesus expanded our understanding of that con concept. It wasn't just something superficial in terms of actually physically murdering somebody. As Jesus points out in Matthew 5.21, you've heard it said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders shall be in danger of the judgment. And the judgment there is capital punishment under the Mosaic law. But Jesus then expands this so because the, the, the Pharisee just had a superficial view of these sins. He, you're, you're not much of a sinner if you only have three basic overt sins. The, the more shallow your view of sin, the less of a sinner we are. And so Jesus is pointing out now, sin, sin is bone deep and we're not, we don't get away with it just because we, we don't do a couple of things that are more overt. He says, but I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. Not just physical murder, but you need, but if you're angry without a cause. And whoever says to his brother, Racha, 
shall be in danger of the council, that is the Sanhedrin, being brought up on charges before the Sanhedrin. So this is an intensified uh, anger. And then whoever says, you fool, shall be in danger of Gehenna, that's temporal punishments, not the lake of fires we studied when we went through Matthew chapter 5. So here Jesus ratchets it up. So when Peter talks about uh, murder here, he's not just talking about literal murder. He is also would be including with it from his understanding that murder involves much, much more than that. Uh, but of course, it's at least that on a, on a limited basis. Then the second, um, second phrase is a thief. This is the word kleptes. We get our word uh, kleptomaniac, somebody who is stealing things. Uh, sometimes we refer to a certain kind of government as a kleptocracy because they put their want to have their hands in our pockets stealing our money uh, too many times. So it's kleptase. It just refers to somebody who is stealing uh, from others. You know, if you don't believe in private ownership of property, which is what you have in communism and in socialism, if you don't have private ownership of property, nobody can be a thief. Because the very concept of being a thief implies that people have the right to own things that are theirs exclusively, and nobody else has a right to it. The third category is that of an evil doer, and it just what it means, it's someone who does evil, and this would include a range of sins, not just those that are criminal. And then the and they're mentioned twice in First Peter. 1 Peter 2.12, have your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, see, just, just blaming them and assigning guilt to them for all kinds of, of bad, bad actions. And 1 Peter 2.14, or to govern, you were to be obedient to a list, and he says, or to governors, as to those who are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers. Now here, evildoers would have the idea of those who are criminal because they're being punished by the government. And so then Peter comes along and he says, and for being a busybody, and this sets it apart from the other three just by the virtue of the grammar, uh, or uh, the or comes into play there and sets it apart. So some have argued that the other three are primarily criminal and being a busybody is a sin, and that may very well be so. He is setting these things up there basically to say, if you're suffering for doing wrong things, whether they're criminal or sin, then that's justified suffering. But if anyone suffers as a Christian, this is interesting because it's the only time in the New Testament that a believer uses the term Christian to refer to Christians. It's used twice in Acts, but there it's the um, not unbelievers in Antioch that have started calling uh, believers Christians, and it has the idea of being uh, a partisan or a follower of someone. And so they, that's why they're initially called Christians. Their followers are of the party of Christ. Agrippa refers uh, to Christians, uh, to Paul. He is not a believer. But in this passage, it is Peter that is using the term, and he equates that to those who are suffering for the name of Christ. So if anyone suffers as a Christian for your belief in Christ and understanding of who he is, then he says, let him not be ashamed. This is a society and a culture uh, that didn't want to ha lose faith. They didn't want to be embarrassed publicly. And so this was something that culturally was, was something that was extremely distasteful for them. And so to take a stand for Jesus would and be accused publicly of something would be a public embarrassment. They would lose face. And so what Peter is reminding them is that there's nothing more glorious than to suffer uh, 
uh, as a Christian suffer for Christ. And so we should glorify God in this manner. And again, I want to point out that the concept of glorifying God is a concept of showing his importance, his centrality in our lives. So without God, we can't handle suffering. That without God, we, we're not going to have the life that we have. That God is the basis for our joy, our peace, our stability, everything in our life. That is how we uh, glorify God. And then um, we come to verse 17. For the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Now, we're running out of time, so I don't have time to get into this, but let me just summarize it very quickly. Verse 18 is a quote from Proverbs 11.31. And verse 18 tells us uh, very much that this is a contrast between uh, the righteous who is scarcely saved. And this verb, sozo, is only used in Peter to refer to physical deliverance, not eternal salvation. So it's talking about deliverance from a test. And it, he, but he, basically what he's saying is that the righteous one is saved with difficulty from the trials of this life, then how much more will it be difficult for the ungodly and the sinner when they bef appear before the great white throne judgment? It's an a fortiori argument, that is an argument from strength, that if it's this tough in this life and God is overseeing things for believers and we face undeserved suffering, then how much more difficult will it be for unbelievers when they face a righteous God at the great white throne judgment? And so what he's emphasizing here is the value of the undeserved suffering in the life of the believer. He's not really pounding down on the future judgment for the unbeliever. But he is talking about the reality and the difficulty of suffering in this life uh, for Jesus as a Christian, but that it's nothing compared to the judgment that will come to those who don't have Jesus, those who have not obeyed the gospel, and their eternal condemnation, which will lead to his conclusion in verse 19, therefore that let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to him in doing good as to a faithful creator. In other words, don't give in, don't fail, don't fall apart, persevere in undeserved suffering. We'll look at those three verses and move forward some in our study next Thursday night. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you that you, we are encouraged to know that that even though we as believers have not faced much suffering for being a Christian, maybe some ridicule here, an insult there, a snide remark someplace else, but in terms of facing the loss of treasure, the loss of our homes, the loss of family, uh, that has not been our experience. But Father, that day may come and the way our culture is rapidly shifting away from a a biblical heritage, we know that we may face this. And this is how we should look to it. It's something that is used by you to purify, to evaluate us, to demonstrate before the angels and mankind uh, the character that you've built into us. And to bring glory to you is the highest thing that we can ever face, that we might suffer for the truth of your word and for who Jesus is and what he's done for us. And Father, we pray that we might learn from your word now that when these times come, we may have strength of soul to trust in you no matter what and rejoice when the fiery trial comes upon us. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.